Hello everyone and welcome to another session of AP Human Geography with Mr. Elrod. Today we're going to do something a little bit different and we're going to talk about FRQs. FRQs seem to be something that really give a lot of people uh, I say a hard time. I think we stress them out a little bit. Uh, the FRQs for Human Geography are 50% of the AP tests. There are three of them and you have to answer those three. Now one of the things about the FRQs is that uh, as far as AP writing goes, FRQs tend to be one of the easiest to write. Not so the easiest to score on, but certainly one of the easiest to write in terms of format, because really all you have to do is provide content. And so when we're talking about the FRQs, really one of the easiest way in order to score well is to know your content. One of the other things that I'm going to talk about today is not just uh, the content of the question, but we're also going to look at some of the things that we can use within the question to help us kind of understand the way in which I need to go about approaching the question so that I can gain the maximum amount of points. So specifically today we're going to look at the 2016 exam. Question number two, this is the lowest scoring question on the exam, even though uh, as far as scores go, this actually had a pretty high score if you look at years past. Um, so the question itself is, it says many countries around the world, including Canada, have more than one official language, and this is what is known as the prompt. You do not have to respond to the prompt. The prompt is typically just used to get you start thinking uh, in a particular direction in a certain kind of way. Now on this question, you would have actually seen uh, up above the question, you would have seen a map of Canada with uh, the, the uh, province of Quebec shaded in. It didn't tell you it was Quebec, it didn't have any markers on the map or anything like that, but you needed to know uh, that that was Quebec. So anyway, that's the prompt. A part says, identify the primary language spoken by most inhabitants of the shaded area on the map. B says, explain how bilingualism can have a positive impact on a country. C says, explain how bilingualism can have a negative impact on a country. And D part says, discuss two reasons other than language why Canada does not fit the nation state concept. So first things first, let's first break down the question and look at what exactly it is that you needed to do when you are looking at this particular question. So the first thing we need to, uh, to look at is what is the question asking me to do? So in A part we were asked to identify. Uh, to identify is exactly what it sounds like. You just simply need to identify the thing that's happening. So in this case we're talking about the language of French. It just needs to be a short simple state, statement or sentence. You don't necessarily need to go into any further explanation. Now at this point we'll go ahead and maybe talk about uh, organization. I always tell my students one of the best things that they can do is organize, the, organize their answer to the question in the exact same way that the question is given. So you know this, this, notice this question has an A through D part. And what I would tell my students is they need to organize their essay in an A through D part and answer each of those questions individually. Uh, you do this, number one, because for the reader at the, at the grading, uh, this makes reading your FRQ much easier. Secondly, you're going to focus on each specific section of the FRQ uh, much more deliberately if you answer them by themselves. If, a lot of times if you answer uh, an essay in an essay that's all together, and kind of mixed in there, sometimes you might actually miss a part of the, uh, the question because you're just simply kind of going through each question. You're not thinking deliberately about each section of the question. So I would recommend organizing it in the exact same way as presented to you. Uh, B part asks you to explain. Whenever you're asked to explain something, note that this is going to require a little bit more complicated response. So typically two or more sentences, maybe two to three sentences. Now one of the things that I have there is first, since we're talking about the positive impacts of bilingualism, number one, you need to identify what would be a positive impact of bilingualism. Then you need to go back and explain why you feel like that would be a positive, that would have a positive impact. A lot of times, students in this section, when it says to explain, they'll simply uh, just identify something and leave it at that. You have to go back and explain why you think that particular item would be positive or would have a positive impact. Same thing with C part you need to identify something that is that you feel like is negative and then explain why you think that particular element would be negative. So really you're doing two things. You're identifying, then you're explaining why the thing you've identified would either be positive or negative. And D part is not much different. Whenever it asks you to discuss, notice that you have to do, you have to uh, talk about two things here. It's the same thing. You have to identify two reasons why Canada does not fit the idea of the nation state. So first of all, you need to identify what the nation state is, tell us what it is, then go back and then identify two reasons why Canada doesn't fit that mold other than language. So once you've identified that thing, 
then you need to go back and discuss how that thing causes can to not fit the mold of the nation state. So uh, you have to I you have to identify those things, but you do not necessarily have to define what those particular things are. So you, maybe you could talk about uh, you you could talk about centrifugal forces, but you don't necessarily have to define centrifugal forces in order to get the point. You just have to identify those things, and then you have to discuss it. Uh, so that way you can get all the points that are available. One of the things I like to do with my students is actually break down the questions themselves and talk about points. So you notice that this particular question is worth seven points. Uh, most questions, as far as I understand, the College Board has decided they want questions to be worth between six and nine points. Um, and typically, whenever you're asked to do one item, for every item you're asked to do, that's going to be worth one point. So again, this particular question is worth seven points, and you can see the breakdown uh, there on the screen. Notice the mean score for this question was 3.13. A lot of times students, they get real anxious because they think they need to score perfect on everything in order to pass the test. What I tell my students is if, you, if you're looking to get maybe a 3 or a 4, kind of put yourself in that 3 to 4 range, all you need to do is get 50% plus 1 of the available possible points. So that means for this question, if it's 7 points, you only need to get 4 points on this particular question in order to put yourself in a good position to make a 3 or 4. Now if you're looking to make a 5, certainly you need to get the 6 to 7 points. That's going to put you in position to get a 5. But a lot of students get really anxious and they think they have to be perfect. That's not the case at all. If you're able just to grab 4 out of the 7 points here, that's really going to put you in a good spot to get at least, uh, at least a 3 or 4. Notice that uh, you know, half the students didn't even score a 4. So if you score that 4, it's going to put you above at least half the students who took this particular test. So that's one thing I try to help my students with so that I uh, help them not worry so much about FRQs as they go into the test. Now if we look at the particular uh, parts of the question, so A part of the answer was French. That's all you need to write. The, the language spoken in this region was French. Um, and really just in order to answer this question, you've got to know, you know, you got to know your geography. Obviously it's a geography course, but you look at that, you had to know, number one, that was the country of Canada. Even if you didn't necessarily know that that particular region was Quebec, if you knew that the country was Canada, and this is where you get to your generalization, if you knew that the country was Canada, you maybe you understood that there was a linguistic issue. If you know your history, you know that the French colonized Canada, so that might lead you in the direction uh, to know that that particular language that they're dealing with, maybe if you didn't, again, even if you didn't know it was Quebec, the language that they're dealing with is French because that's really the only language issue that comes up when we're talking about Canada. The other issues that you might deal with with Canada is devolution and talking about the Nunavut region or maybe even the secession of Quebec. But you know that the Nunavut region really is not about uh, language, it's more about the, the native people wanting uh, autonomy for themselves and so that's language really isn't going to come into it. So again, you got to know your geography, you got to know that's the country of Canada, you should be able to generalize and understand uh, from your general knowledge about uh, what's going on in a place in order to uh, in order to answer the question. If you look at B part and it's asking for positive impacts of uh, bilingualism, you really have to put yourself in the mindset of the geographer. Obviously, it's a geography course, uh, but people who are in the discipline uh, maybe uh, you have to think about the way that they think. Typically when we're talking about cultural diversity, uh, geography in general is going to talk about this as a positive element of society. Not that it's not a positive element of society, but they on its face will talk about, uh, will talk about uh, cultural diversity as positive because they, they talk about how uh, it creates this idea of inclusiveness and uh, how it creates understanding between different groups of people. And so that's the way they're really going to present the argument. And so if you can just kind of go about the conversation generally talking about how greater cultural diversity brings greater understanding and uh, brings people together and that typically is going to help you in the direction of, of answering that particular part of the question. Looking at uh, looking at the uh, chief readers comments on the question it looks like scale was an issue and students what they were doing is they were talking about specific individuals and how bilingualism would help them as opposed to how bilingualism would help bring the country together as a whole. So scale is something that human geography has been focusing on for the last couple of years, so you really have to pay attention to when you need to address specific types of scale within the question, so just make sure that you pay attention to that. In C part, again, thinking about uh, thinking like a geographer and thinking about the things that are going to create separation in space. Uh, anytime that you deal with differences of people, a lot of times this creates 
separation in political geography you should have talked about centrifugal forces uh, and so that's going to divide people and whether that's uh, you know forces of differences of religion or uh, ethnicity or culture whatever it happens to be uh, just note that those differences are going to divide people and so language provides that exact same uh, exact same um, type of division and if we're talking about centrifugal forces then you can move into the conversation uh, about things like devolution and you know depending on how you talk about devolution some people feel like it can be good and it can be bad so in this case you need to couch your argument in a negative sense and talk about how devolution is creating additional separation within Canada and, and people kind of creating um, alternative, not alternative, but separate uh, political identities uh, and so you need to address it in that kind of way. And then D, for D part, really the most significant thing here was to make sure you know your terminology. Vocabulary is so important for the course, not just memorizing vocabulary, but you really have to know those words in order to answer the question. If you didn't know what a nation state was, then really it would have been impossible for you to answer the question correctly. Now, if you knew what the nation state was, then go ahead and define that and tell, uh, tell the reader that you know what the nation state is. And since you know that you're supposed to talk about how Canada does not fit the idea of a nation state, then since you've defined it, all of your responses should go contrary to the concept of a nation state. So you're looking at things that are going to make people different. And so since you know nation state is about sameness, about the homogeneous cultural landscape or the hom uh, homogeneous culture, you know you're going to look for elements of culture that are different, that are separate from people. So if we have bilingualism in a country, typically this is going to mean that we have different ethnic groups within the country. And so talking about cultural diversity uh, within the country is going to get you into that uh, conversation on how Canada does not fit the nation state concept. If you can provide some specific examples, talk about uh, the French in Quebec, you can talk about uh, the Asian populations that have moved into the west coast. Uh, because of their proximity to uh, to the continent, but again, just kind of approaching it from that uh, from that particular perspective, uh, very much what I would consider kind of a logical approach to to answering the question. If you're familiar with Canada's political system, knowing that it is uh, a predominantly a republic, then you know that um, sorry, it's predominantly a federal system. So that you know that uh, the local governments have some control. If you know about the devolution that's been happening in, the, in Canada over the past uh, several years, then you can talk about how uh, the, the, the devolution is really kind of more about the political separation of different groups of people creating different political identities for themselves as opposed to just moving power back to the local governments. And so you could frame your conversation uh, in that particular way. So there you have it. That's the 2016 FRQ. I hope that I was able to provide you not only with information on how you could have answered the question, but also ways that you can feel a little bit more comfortable uh, answering uh, FRQs. Uh, I hope that you found that helpful. I hope I can do a couple more videos on FRQs to help you become more successful. Really, you, know, you guys have been taking uh, multiple choice tests for such a long period of time that I would assume that you're, you do pretty well on multiple choice. So really, it's going to be the FRQs that are, uh, are going to make you or break you on the AP test. So really focus on those. Practice your skills with writing the FRQs. Make sure you focus on those keywords like identify, um, explain, and discuss, and then make sure you do a, a thorough enough job so that you can get all those points that are there. And don't stress. You don't need to get 100% of it right in order to get that three or four on the test. So I, I hope you found that helpful. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to shoot those to me. Thanks for watching, and as always, I hope to see you next time.